Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love the show, share it with your friends and join our newsletter at eu.vc. Today, we're happy to welcome you to our favorite type of episode, our memo episode. That means we'll be diving deep on a fund that the EU VC LP syndicate is investing into, together with the GP team. So please welcome Boris and Diana, founding partners of Smock Ventures, an operator-led VC fund focusing on top zero founders from the Central Eastern Europe region. At EU VC, we're hyped about this investment because Smock Ventures have risen to become the first choice fund among many serial entrepreneurs in less than two years of operation by delivering on their promise of connecting the Central Eastern Europe and global venture ecosystem with more than 80% of the money raised by portfolio startups coming from outside the region. What is more is Boris and Diana are amazing human beings who our syndicate investors can count on to not only deliver returns, but also insights, learnings, and access to the region. We hope you'll enjoy meeting Boris and Diana in this episode and invite you to reach out if you want to learn more about how to join the EU VC LP syndicate. If you enjoy our content, do support us by hitting the follow button, giving us a review and following the European VC on LinkedIn. Boris, Diana, welcome to the European VC, but more importantly, welcome to the special memo episode. Our listeners are used to it already, I hope. And this is a really cool episode that we love doing because it also marks kind of the public announcement of our syndicate into Smog Ventures Fund 2. Boris, we've had you on the pod, so our loyal listeners will kind of know you already. Diana, it's the first time we welcome you. So I'd love to start off by giving you some time, some some kind of focus here in the beginning of who the hell is Diana? Give us a quick rundown. Hi, David. Thank you for having me here. My story is I'm a physicist. I'm an engineer. And after that, I wanted to venture into something more and then actually started working with Boris. I started officially as event office manager for Reactor War. So that was a startup hub started in Warsaw by Boris and a few other startup founders like 12 years ago. And then after working some time with Boris, we knew we can build something bigger and better t- together. And we founded Reactor X, so our pre-acceleration program. That was my focus for a few years. So we took startups from idea to the first funding and we accelerated 100 startups in Reactor X. And after running Reactor X together with Boris, we knew, okay, we are getting startups to the first funding and then we can meet the first funding for those startups. So that's my that's my story. And uh, Boris, I think that's the perfect kind of way to set up my first question of the memo episode, which is I always like to start with the origin story, right? So Smock, where does it come from? Because understanding the origin story for me is really cool because it gives me a great understanding of the core principles and focus of that firm. So I'd love to hear you and also Diana, of course, share that. Hello, everyone. Again, really happy to be here. There is two origin stories. So there is a Silicon Valley origin story and there is a Poland, Eastern Europe origin story. As Diana already mentioned, we've worked together for you know five years or so before starting Smock in Warsaw, you know, building the ecosystem, being one of the first people to actually, you know, start helping founders in the early stages in Warsaw and in Central Eastern Europe. At the same time, Paul and Dan Bregel, our partners at Smog, have been doing the same thing in Silicon Valley. They started the first acceleration program in San Francisco back in 2008 or so. And then they've been, you know, angel investing uh, in some amazing companies, actually, including, you know, Uber, Stripe, Unity, Zappos, Shipbook, Discord, Carousel, a number of unicorns at the same time. So once we met with Paul and we've been hosting him in Warsaw, we've been showing him uh, the local ecosystem, it turned out that this is a really good match with us having a really good deal flow in the region and then being able to help those startups once they grow big enough to be able to expand globally, both to the Silicon Valley and to Asia. So that's the origin story, just kind of the right timing to connect those two ecosystems together. And if I may ask, because I feel that it's a natural question a lot of our listeners will have is regarding team dynamics and roles. You know, you just talked about the CE, uh, US kind of different origin stories. So there's kind of two sub teams, right, inside of the smog team. And what is the role of each side and what should people expect from each different GP and, and venture partner as well in the team? Yeah, I do the talking kind of the work and the guys just, you know, hang out and try to help. <laughs> you do the so, talking, you know, Diana uh, does the work and the guys have the brand. 
more <laughs> like we focus on the fuel flow uh, and they're coming to building locally. Uh, uh, Paul and Dan are obviously not as involved, but uh, as for decision making, we actually do have a Bruegel Brothers phase for every startup that we talk to. And every startup, either Jana or myself, you know, wants to invest into, we want either Paul and Dan to have a chat, to have to, to kind of understand the US perspective on this startup, on this industry. So once we kind of make a decision to, to go and go ahead with an investment, we always want the whole team to be on board. And how we make decisions has been changing. But for now, we just need one person in the team to be really convinced and others not to be opposing too much. That's more or less how the dynamics work. Yeah, I don't want to add something. Yeah, I would say like we want all of the GPs to be on board because all of us then get involved to help the founders, to help the team. So it's really like all of the startups, they first come to Boris or myself or, or the other team members we have like we have in, in Poland or Ukraine or uh, or Romania. And then in the end, it's all, it always gets to the US level to, to evaluate. But we wouldn't invest if, if we feel that either Paul and Dan cannot be helpful. If it's a startup that's just based in, say, Romania or Ukraine, and they are not expanding soon uh, globally to the markets that we can be really helpful, which means either Asia or US, we wouldn't be interested in investing. Yesterday, we had a really nice chat with some of our uh, syndicate members and some people in the Smok Ventures uh, network, so to speak, or community, if you will. And Boris, you shared something that connects to what we're just talking about, which was your learnings from Fund 1 and how is that kind of affecting your thinking and your op- operating in Fund 2. So Boris, I'd love to ask you to kind of summarize that again for the listeners that couldn't make make that call. But also, Diana, I'd love to ask you the exact same question. Learnings from Fund 1 that you're implementing in Fund 2. We were pretty new to venture investing, myself and Jana. Uh, we, I mean, completely new, newbies, <laughs> beginners, novices, when we started the fund uh, as proper emerging managers for years ago. So we had to learn how the hell this works. And, uh, you know, as every uh, newbie investor, you're really excited about every startup that you talk to first. So the first 10 startups I talked to, I was like, two of them, I was like, yeah, let's put a check on them. And then we talked to Paul and Dan and they were like, guys, this is not a level of quality we would be really interested in. I was like, really? And then I saw the 100 startups. And then in a year, we saw a 1,000 startups. And I was like, right. That's like, now I kind of see the perspective. Now I kind of know which ones are the ones that we want to go for. But the fact that we saw some uh, really shitty startups in the beginning, we also saw some good ones. And we couldn't really tell the difference that much. I was really convinced to do some investments that we should have made. Actually, I should have been more pushy by just didn't have the confidence yet to push investment because I didn't have the experience. Now, with a bit like three years of experience investing in some of the top startups in Poland, I'm way more confident to be pushing my point of view, even though some of the other team members might not be <laughs> super excited. Good and bad, another thing. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Well, I would say like investing early stage is like art and science. So, you ha- and like I said, it's physics. So, everything was like black and white. You have, you know, you calculate and you know the. The right answer right away investing in startups is like it's long term and you don't know right away okay what is the the right answer i will i will learn in a few years so you have to like combine your gut feeling and it takes months years to you know to build that and to be sure of of, of the investments that you're doing i would say also it was a change of the mindset it was running acceleration program and pre-acceleration you take everyone you want to help everyone and you know that's that's the most important part part you have to you want to be inclusive and trying a VC fund, you have to be, you have to be very picky about who you work with and you don't have time to work with everyone. So I would say that's the change of mindset, how you in the end work with startups. I think that's one thing that we haven't touched on enough yet. And that is the relationship or rather the origin story of Smok's Polish team and the, and, and the US team. How do you connect and from where do you know each other? Because I think that's an important story and one of the reasons why, because listening here you might get the you know the the feeling that okay it's two different teams they don't know each other too well blah 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 but that's not the truth at all so i'd love for you to dive into that a bit i I know paul bragel for about eight years before we launched smog like he was a bit of a hero to me he was like you know this american investor coming to eastern europe once in a while why the hell he's even thinking you know this is interesting so when he was in poland in warsaw i used to you know run like a small dinner for him to get him to know the Polish entrepreneurs, 
the emerging startup ecosystem, the first founders, a lot of those guys became our investors, our LPs now in the fund uh, after eight years. And then we've been just chatting a lot. We get, you know, friendly. We, 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 when I was in San Francisco, we used to have beers. And when he was in Eastern Europe, he would, we would go to some conferences together. And then he, he, he started to be super helpful. He started making intros to me when I was at that time, I was still running my startup, the master, and I was kind of at the end of it. And I was kind of looking for exit options. And Paul became really helpful at that at that stage. And he actually did intro me to Ashwin Nabin from Samba TV, who eventually acquired uh, my company. So he was super impactful in my previous business. And, and then once that happened, uh, and then I spent some time at Samba, I helped build the company, the company's European um, uh, headquarters. We grow it to almost a billion dollar company. Then we hang out with Paul again. And he was like, I got some good feeling about you and your team. And I would like to work together. And I was like, oh my God, really? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. <laughs> and it was like, how do you do it? And then we already were running the acceleration program. So it's kind of worse. was not an easy choice, but it was like a natural next step for us to take it take it forward and to try to build something bigger of the ecosystem that we've already created. So it was a natural move to us, but still pretty unexpected. And I'm still kind of really honored to be able to work with the guys, both Paul and Dan Bregel, who we've met after we decided to, you know, to start uh, to start Smock. So now that the listeners know the who's who of <laughs> Smock Ventures and also the story behind that, I think it's good to kind of give everyone a common understanding of, of what Smock Ventures Fund 2 is. And I'll go ahead and, and, and give it my try and then you guys correct me and comment. But I think more interestingly, is I think I have the data right. But anyway, more interestingly, probably just kind of expanding a bit on the rationale and the core assumptions behind that. So the whys and what do you guys strongly believe that led you to set up the fund in, in this way with this strategy, whatever. And so just for our listeners, I think what's relevant to say is, you know, Smock Ventures Fund 2, it's a 50 million euro target, target fund. It's going to invest early. So backing Poland's tech entrepreneurs early, which is something that Fund One already did, but also lead top CEC investments. And you guys are going basically tapping into your network of local angels and pre-seed VCs. And Diana is traveling a lot um, these days to also help expand those networks. And then, of course, connected to your value add, help raise rapid follow-ons. Uh, and that obviously is connected to what we're just talking about, like the team and, and, and how you guys operate. So with that kind of Setting the stage, I'd love to ask you guys what I said. So the rationale and the core assumptions behind this and why, why are you doing this? Why are you setting yourself up to, to run this fund? I would say we are pretty confident doing the early stage investments. So what we've been doing at Smoke Plans, we are doing president seat investments. So we want to be the first institutional investor in the company. So we invest, after, sometimes founders bootstrap, sometimes they're angel investors. And then when they want to work with the VCs, we want to be the first one in and we tend to be the lead investors and we want to be the committed investor that believes in the company. And after that, we, we have the companies raising the next rounds and we wanted to duplicate that from Smoke 1 to Smoke 2. So, so Smoke 1 was investing into Polish companies and we've been doing that. And with Smoke 2, we decided, okay, let's expand that. Let's focus on the CE region, on the emerging Europe. I think there is still so much potential on the market. It's There is still so much capital needed to be invested in the in the emerging Europe, Europe market that we want to focus on this region. And it will be still precedent seed investment. So we still want to be early stage. And I should probably add that we're doing software and gaming. So most of the fund is like software investment. So we, we want to invest into companies which are going to scale, but also we like some perspective, like twenty percent of the fund is going into gaming studios, gaming gaming companies. So this is our other focus. I would say we rose to become one of the first choice uh, fund among serial entrepreneurs in uh, less than two years of operation in Poland. We won the race for talent, and we it's not enough for us. Like you know, Poland is a great country, but we feel the whole region needs. A, you know, a similar approach. And also that's, you know, Paul Bregel's uh, ambition as well. He used to, he's, he's created those funds before in Central, you know, Southeast Asia, in Africa, in South America. So we, there is a template that we can actually follow to create a leading venture capital fund investing in seed stage in a, in a new emerging market, in a new region. So it, it felt to us that we should be still focusing on Poland. That's going to be a, a lot of our effort. But we we feel the opportunity is huge, uh, and and that's why we you know hired our first principal in Ukraine. That's why we running an exploration program in Romania. That's why we focusing a lot on on South East Europe as well because we feel long term uh, this is going to be a huge market, and I think it's not too late 
to become a leader, kind of like, you know, Andreessen kind of Sequoia, like VC fund operating in this market and being known for having the best deals uh, in this specific uh, market. That's why we we expanding. That's why we increasing the fund size. That's why we're thinking building a culture versus just becoming a small boutique um, VC fund. I'd love to ask, because you have a focus on serial entrepreneurs, and that is different from the diamond in the rough strategy that, that other players have. I'd love to ask, why do you have this focus on serial entrepreneurs and how does that affect your operations? I, I think that is it's, it's two markedly different strategies. It's easier to know how, how things are done. Um, but I feel that it's a bit different when you talk about serial entrepreneurs in Western Europe or in, uh, in the US versus when you talk in Eastern Europe, because most of those serial entrepreneurs that we've invested in in, in Fund One haven't had a, like a, they haven't built unicorns yet. They haven't, they've built local leaders in Poland, local leaders in other uh, European, uh, Eastern European countries. So their ambition is still big. They're not lazy. <laughs> they are basically, they are just on, before their biggest uh, venture of their lifetime. And we want to tap into them the earliest, the, in a, before they even start, before they even, like at the same time when they have an idea, we want to be backing them. That's how we did it with uh, Ophologic or Sunroof. So we were the first institutional investor. We kind of convinced them even to take VC funding. And then good things started to happen. You know, Y Combinator, new investors, Western European investors, more funding, growth. I'm not saying we, we won't, won't be doing first-time founders because some of the biggest success stories, High Pats, is a first-time founder. Dorota, okay, she was a VP of growth at Luxi, at, you know, at Polish Unicorn, but she never created a startup before. So we wouldn't be backing out of those deals. But we feel that with the, the deal flow we had, we could really choose the, you know, we could really pick the top of the top in the country. And that's why maybe most of the, the investments went into serial entrepreneurs. But we just, you know, with three actor X, we have a, a bit of a different strategy as well. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to add, to add that because like, we also want to give the chance to, to the first time founders. And sometimes also there is a person who can, we can see the potential in the person, but there is like some small ed like education needed, some like startup education, you know, how to, how to pursue investors, how to get the market fit uh, and to work on all of that, uh, that stuff. So that's why we have Reactor X, so we can still give the education, give our like network, our help, mentors, experts to the first time founders so they can learn and go through the process and validate if what they're doing well, validate if they're, if building a startup is actually for them, because sometimes that's also a result. And validate, okay, do I have a product market fit? Do I know how to sell? Do I, you know, do I know how to run the company? Do I know how to pitch to the VCs? So they get all of that basic knowledge, and then we can we can also work with them for like it, it lasts ten weeks. So after the ten weeks of knowing the person and working with the person with the founder, we know how much potential there is in this person, and should we invest into them? So that's also that gives us more validation about investing. I have a question and, and it's connected to this kind of um, serial entrepreneurs focus. And so here I am sitting in my little home office in, in Lisbon, Portugal, quite far away from, from Eastern Europe. I've been once to Poland and it was for, for like three days and it was like, what, eight years ago, whatever. So when I hear you guys saying we, we're the investor of choice in Poland, yeah, sure, I take it. But what data do you guys have or what numbers can you share with our listeners that actually show that, yeah, we, we, we were an investor of choice. It's not, it's not wishful thinking. It's not a uh, marketing chat. It's actually, it's proven. Best to ask founders always. We, we do have some data, for example, in Landscape, we are the number one VC fund in Central Eastern Europe, uh, according to founders. As for rating, like how, how much value the founders feel uh, we add. But also the numbers kind of show that we've delivered on the promise. We, we, the only promise we had when we started was that we're an American fund investing in Central Eastern Europe. So we want you to be a global company from day one. That means you want, I, we want you to have global investors from day one or just after we invest. And, and we've delivered on that promise, I think, pretty well. 80% uh, of the funding that our startups raised after SMOC came from outside of Central Eastern Europe region mostly from the US and Asia, uh, with triple devaluations, even though last year wasn't that great in venture. So that, I think, shows that, you know, we, we, we bet on really the top talent in the region. 18 out of 24 of our portfolio companies already raised follow-on funding after SMOC, which is pretty good for a pre-seed fund. Usually yeah. that's around 
fifty percent. We got in very early on early valuation points, so the valuations on which we we entered was pretty good as well. So all of those show that you know investors in fund one are pretty happy, but also founders that we've invested in are really happy with the results, even if they gave up some uh, more equity than they would maybe when an American investor would come uh, day one. Yeah. They actually did benefit because the company grew faster than I thought. So this is the same rationale for doing YC super early. It gets you the access that you need you know, to put you in a position to be successful. One of my favorite questions uh, for emerging managers, uh, so not first-time managers, emerging managers, so fund two, fund three, is like as you refine your thesis and you evolve in your strategy, that's probably the best way to say it, some things change. And with changes, some risks come. And I love one of our past uh, memo episodes where the GP was very upfront about the, the biggest risks going into fund two are A, B, and C, right? And I love that. I think that's super interesting and super transparent, but also very informative for anyone considering to invest. So I'd love to repurpose that and ask you guys, what do you think are the biggest risks going from fund one to fund two? We feel confident about our presence in Poland. You know, we're pretty bullish on on Poland in general, and we feel we can tap into the top deals going forward. But Central Eastern Europe is huge and diverse. It comes from Estonia, it ends in you know Serbia, Croatia. A lot of those countries we don't really have a presence yet. Part of the reason Diana has been you know uh, has started traveling and she spends you know a month in all of those uh, European Union ca- European uh, capitals is that to, to tap into those networks. So so that's a big risk that we will miss some of the pay hogs and UA paths of the CE just because we ha- we're not that well known in countries like Croatia or Serbia or or the Balkans or or Bulgaria yet. Some other is the reputation in general. It's just, it, it takes ages to build a reputation. And we've been able to do this in Poland, Ukraine, and this region, uh, because we've been basically operating in, for the last 10 years in this region. It's just a bit harder to go country by country and build it, you know, become a key member of community uh, suddenly. It's going to take time. It's going to take not just fund one, but not just fund two, but also fund three and, and the fund four. Um, if I can, it's also like about building a trust. And in Poland, like as Boris said, we've been here for years. So we've been community builders. We've been doing stuff for the community and with the community. So we were part of that. We weren't some, someone from outside. So we have the trust of the people in the community that if they come to us and they work with us, you know, we are we have the hopefully the reputation of being, of being found, founder friendly. And that's because also we were we were the part of the community and we have the trust that we can, that they can work, work with, that, with us. But uh, just to say, it's not just a risk, it's also an opportunity. We've been, you know, me and Diana, we've been pretty Poland-centric, but Paul and Dan on the other side, they've been doing a lot of investments in centuries in Europe before. And some of those first investments from Smog2 already originate from Paul's previous network. Some of the LPs, uh, limited partners in the fund, like from countries like Slovenia or Czech Republic or Slovakia, also come from... Uh, or Hungary, they come from the, the, the network of Paul and the previous investments of Paul that now became uh, LPs in, in the fund. Part of the reason we're doing EUVC is that we want to really depend on the community, the building part as a, as a way for us to grow in the region. And that's why we want to have investors from every single Central Eastern European country, not just Central Eastern Europe, because, you know, obviously the whole Europe and the world, but especially for deal flow purposes, for val- for validation reputation purposes, this is already proving to be super valuable. Like if you have an LP that can check the reputation of a founder properly with the right people in the ecosystem, that's that's crucial. And that's why we, we you know that's why we want to really you know tap into that that network in the in the in the CE. Yeah, and 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 to our audience listening in, right? It, this is the exact reason why we partner with <laughs> VC firms like 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 Boris's and, and Diana's smug because it is it is we're looking to build these syndicates that don't just deliver you know economic value to you but also strategic value in your career as a venture investor whether that's as an angel or an aspiring VC or a founder that just wants to get more embedded in the ecosystem because you can see in the future that that, that you want to do this type of investments. So I think that that what Boris just said is a really clear definition of exactly why the VC firms that we partner with are interesting for you to invest in with with, with us and our syndicates. Uh, so just wanted to, to point that out. I have one question, which is 
you are increasing fund size and it's it's not just a, a small increase. I'd love you to, to just add a bit on that. Why do you do that and, and how does that affect your, uh, your your portfolio strategy? Part of the reason we do it is is because that's the only way to really build a, a company versus, you know, staying as a boutique fund. That means increasing the fund size also means increasing the number of people we can work with as a team members. And that means bigger deal flow in the countries that we really need to build the deal flow. Focusing on Poland, Ukraine, and, and Romania as the first kind of free main markets. And that's, you know, that's a way for us to be able to actually tap into those networks and hiring people who already have access to those networks, uh, like Sasha and like Luca, we, who we're already working with in those countries. Uh, the kind of portfolio model stays pretty similar, as in we still want to do about 25 to 35 investments from the fund uh, too. So it's similar. We did 24 in fund one, but we want to do a, a lot more follow-on investments in the second fund. I think that already in the fund one, which was 10 mil, we were not very happy that we could not be backing our top companies once they raised Series A or even after they raised the Series A. We just didn't have a, the, the fund size was not big enough to, to do this. And especially now in this current funding ecosystem, which is harder for startups to raise more funding, we need to be able to secure funding for some of the companies we really believe in, we know will be successful, but for example, they're not able to raise on good valuations yet because they haven't yet proven on the market. We still want to be able to keep backing those. So those two reasons, the team and just our, our ambition to become the top seed investor in centuries in Europe and the fact we want to be more helpful to the founders and also a bit more secure for LPs because the bigger fund size and later investments into the later stages means a bit more balance in the way we do our portfolio. We do a lot of pre-seed investments, super risky. A lot of them will fail. There's going to be a lot of write-offs, but we will be able to back some of the top ones, which we normally wouldn't be able to do because most of those companies are not looking for Central Eastern European investors in their Series A. They're looking at, you know, the Boulder Toms, the, the Index Ventures, the Axels, the Sequoias, the Creandums. They're not looking for investor in centuries in Europe. So that's really the only way to be able to be part of Series A's of some of those CE, top CE companies. So I guess three reasons, not two, <laughs> to increase the fund size. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think that that also puts us in, in this topic of, you know, uh, inside of the investment strategy, you know, kind of deep diving a bit of in terms of initial check size, max allocation per company. How do you guys think about that to get that exposure, exposure to the later stage? I'd love, love to hear that as well. We used to do very, very, very small checks at Smoke One, and we, as the market is changing, we are increasing that a bit. So our like we tend to do initial ticket and then the follow on. So the initial tickets we tend like the sweet spot is like five hundred k euro, but will it will range from like hundred hundred k up to a million into the company. So it also depends on the stage of the company that we are investing in. Yeah, and then we want to have put like up to five million euro per per the company in total. So that's how much how much we have reserved to follow on uh, eventually and i think yeah as boris said we'll, we'll have like around 25 35 companies in in the portfolio that we'll be focusing on and we'll follow on on the best of best of best of them we want to promise particular companies to follow on always uh, if there, there's a lead uh, that we want to actually at least put the parada until we can until we get the five mil uh, which usually means follow on in the top companies because the top companies raise more yeah. capital in general <laughs> Do you expect to see a different? Because we've hinted to this, but we haven't given the exact numbers. But do you expect to see a difference on the on the the geo of the deals in terms of initial tickets and so on, or are you thinking that you're going to get it a bit later into the non Polish deals, or is it very much the same? I'd love to hear your your thoughts there as well. So I guess the initial five investments that we've uh, like we've become free. We haven't announced any, so I'm not going to name names, but we 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 have term sheets with five companies. Half of them are pre-seed, the other half is kind of seed stage, bridge financing stage. I think it's going to be a bit more uh, of seed stage investments because just, but that's mostly because, you know, of the of the fact that in Poland we had more access in pre-seed. We, and also there was a number of companies we missed because we did, couldn't invest in CE in the first fund. Yeah. We still want to be part of some of those companies, but our pedigree is pre-seed. So this is where we feel the most comfortable investing, actually, which is the opposite to what most sane people are because they really want to see data. The more data we see, it doesn't really make us more confident. We really want to be 
focusing on doing super, super early deals. So I think there's going to be a transition period. I think we'll still be doing some seed investments that we feel are really good. But the, the later stage you are as a startup, the less likely we're going to be investing. You're going to need to show us a lot more for us to be excited. We really get excited about teams that are just forming initial traction, early customer validation, and being able to be the first one that kind of shape, uh, help to shape the culture of the company and help the entrepreneurs in the early, earliest stages, because this is where we excel. I'd love to ask you, because you said something which I loved yesterday, which is you optimize for upside. It's This is not a game of exiting when there's a good size round and then you know you won't take your money off the table unless maybe if it's a fund returner and then okay then it make, might make sense but as a general rule that is not what you're doing and i love that because i have been feeling that the european ecosystem used to be much you know downside risk protection focused and then we've had two years that i actually think had a good influence on the european venture ecosystem in that sense in that everyone we're willing to take those bets and go for the moonshots because the perceived risk or the re very real risk was lower because we knew that the next round would come. But now I'm starting to see a bit too many in the grapevine saying that things that sound like, okay, we're going to take money off the table whenever I have the option. <laughs> um, and I, I don't like that at all, but I'd love you to, to, to tell us a bit about your reflections there. Sure. I mean, that's the influence of the, our American uh, uh, team members, uh, most likely. Uh, you know, Paul Bregel did an investment in in Zappos back before Amazon bought them, and he still holds Amazon shares from that investment, which was like, I don't know, 100x or more. So he is really long term. And that kind of thinking into how, how you think of venture kind of got to us as well. And we feel this is also the way for us to optimize for the biggest multiples. Like, we need this first few funds to be 5x funds or better for us to be really successful in this market. We don't want to be a mediocre fund that returns, you know, 2x, 1x. Obviously, that might happen, but we at, at least how we structure, how we think of our portfolio creation, we're not optimizing for early exits. Some of the LPs obviously maybe would like that. And we are pretty, pretty transparent about that, that we will, you, you shouldn't really be expecting money back uh, before it year eight or so of the second fund. But once you do, uh, there is a bigger chance yeah. that it's going to be a really good investment for you. Yeah, it's just in our pedigree. It's something that you just need to be okay with uh, once we invest. It's long-term investment. It's, uh, it's being part of the community. It's just kind of betting on the fact that Smog becomes one of the top funds in the region and you benefit together with us, not just financially, but also by just being part of this course yeah. i have to just add a little note there of the for us uvc it's you know it's it's really exciting to 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 do these syndicates into into vcs in europe but there is a lot to be said about the expected returns profile right so what you said boris resonates a lot with us and i think i think it's important to, to share right is that you want to build a fund and or funds that return 5x plus you're not targeting 3x right the jury's still out. Will you will you be able to? Well, we don't know, right? We believe so, but no one really knows, right? But you're targeting 5X plus. And I think that is really important for us, at least in terms of, you know, if we are to put our capital in and, and, and raise a syndicate into any fund, well, damn well, must be 5X plus, right? Because the risk profile is there. So I just love that. And I just wanted to, to double click on that. One question from my side, still on the strategy, probably my last one is, we spoke about software and game dev as the verticals. I honestly, as an individual, I took some time to understand the model, the VC model in game dev. <laughs> so I'd love, I'd love to maybe just let you guys give a quick rundown. I think software is quite, is quite obvious and standard. Everyone knows, but of course, what's the breakdown again? I know Diana hinted it, to it, but just so it's super clear to everyone and then give us a quick kind of overview of, of how does that work in, in the game dev, which many people might not be very uh, aware of actually. I would say game dev is a very different market than investing to software and even like how you build the company, how you build the culture and how the market looks like and how you look for the next investors and the exits. So our strategy is like we are not investing for games. We are not the publisher. We are not like 
those kind of gaming investors that we invest into game. We invest into gaming studio. So we invest into the company that has long term term strategy. Okay, the, the time we are investing, okay, we are building this game or a few games at the time, but we have a plan how to build the, the whole value of the company with, with the next games that we are playing with that we are building. So what's important is we invest into the, into the companies that have the plan to build the value of the company with the whole gaming franchise. Right now, the, the focus in, ga- in games is building also the IP. So we, I'm personally, what I like about the gaming studios I, I'm talking with, what kind of IP they are building, because that's what one of the most valuable things you can actually sell in this like entertainment ecosystem, I would say. So that's uh, that's our focus. And is that, you just hinted to the IP they're building, that's what gets you excited. Is that basically the asset that's connected to the exit strategy? And is that is that why you find it so interesting? And what I'm hinting to is what is the exit strategy in game dev investing, basically? I would say, like, in terms of, like, what the companies that are looking to buy, the gaming com- companies are looking for, IP can be one of the most valuable assets that you can actually sell. You know, sometimes there is technology, so like, but it's more, like, around gaming, so, like, tool, tools for game development. So that that's also exciting for me. And I think that's going to, to, to grow. But with the IP, you know, you can go to Netflix and you create Netflix series. You can build a board game. You can build, like, you can, you can, you can sell toys. So that's what gets the most value, I would say. So that's the main aim. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, there is user base. You can you can have, you know, with the mobile games, you have like hundreds, thousands of users playing in the game. So you get the community, you get the ecosystem. So that, that can also be valuable. I would say the smallest exits are the user base exits where a bigger company takes over the game and, and kind of, you know, uses their assets to to even to grow it even further. Yeah. But the biggest ones are when there is both the audience both the the user base and the IP that you can build on and create the cult franchise based on a game. And that's you know, the success of some of the Polish game studios like the CD Projekt Red, the creators of The Witcher a franchise, or Techland, the creators of The Dying Light. That's how the value of those those companies were created. But also talking about the Polish gaming ecosystem, like usually what we still don't have enough in the C region is the, like the success stories. Like the stories that that create alumnus and you know the the paper mafia example for it. So we, we are still building this this effect in the C yeah. region. So in the gaming sphere in the in Poland, we had already some like we had a global success with the city, city project. Everyone plays The Witcher. So Poland was put on the global map of game gaming ecosystem, and that also created the mindset in Polish founders and Polish game developers that, hey, we can actually build a global company out of Poland. So, hey, let's so let's do that. So that's also accelerated the, the development of the gaming ecosystem, how much knowledge also there is, and they have somewhere, someone to learn from how to build those global ge- companies. And uh, our fir- first free investments in, in the gaming in Poland is alumni of uh, CD Projekt Red, Techland, and Huge Games. So the three biggest companies in the gaming uh, ecosystem in Poland. So you can see that the, the kind of Gaming Polish gaming mafia is the real thing. <laughs> I love that. Um, so, um, Boris, I have a question on your value add to founders because, and, and I've said this many times, and I think uh, it's something that people will also see in in the communication that we put out about Smug. That we love you guys for being incredibly transparent and telling it like it is and this is on what this is one of the fronts where you are not sweetening founders with a bunch of promises that you can't deliver on i love you to just expand a bit on your value add strategy and and why you choose to deliver the type of value that you do i think it's best to use examples when you do value add because everyone says hey we're gonna get you the next round you're gonna get you the customers we're gonna be super helpful and provide for you know value strategic advice it's all bullshit. Like it's like it's just so common that no one really believes that. So it's easier when you're raising the second fund because you can already show what you've actually helped. And we've helped raise capital. We you know we've helped our founders raise capital from U.S., Singapore, Japan, Scandinavia, London, Hong Kong. We get two companies to Y Combinator through the help of of Dan Bregel and actually working with those companies of Logic and uh, View Storefront. Very strategically about getting to YC and how and why this makes sense for those specific companies. We've connected them with top founders and experts globally in the countries they wouldn't really have access to. We even helped hire top talent to companies like uh, Hypads, where we helped them find a, both a co-founder and a 
first main product person. And some of the most successful people in the in the different industries, we connected our founders to them and they became investors. Say in, in companies like uh, Instrimly, we connected them with the investors in specific specifically interested in gaming and entertainment. So those things we've already done. What I talk to founders, do I promise those things? Not really. I would say we yeah, use our network. Our network is huge. It's unprecedented for centuries in Europe. I don't think there is a fund with a network like ours, including Poland and Bragiel and their vast ecosystem they've built globally. So, But you have to be smart how to work with them and to, be, to, to know the timing well. So it's all in the founders' hands to really use that. The top founders are really good in picking the right time, picking the right people that they can take from or they can connect with because of our network, Ghana's network, my network, and Paul and Dan. So I would say the biggest value is the network. Mm, there's a few more values. I think when we talk to founders, we, we hear when the founders talk about us, they say they're regular guys. Usually that, that's how they like, they're just like, you know, they, they, they're not the finance guys, they're the founders. So we are engineers and founders. It's just e different, especially in the earlier stages. I think that's a value for founders to kind of feel they can talk to us. So we've done this before we had that. I went through that sinusoid of running a few companies uh, and Paul and Dan did that too. And Diana did that with acceleration program. So we've seen that before we can, re they can relate to us a bit more. And I think, so being just humans, <laughs> I think that helps. Not being jerks is a big value, <laughs> trying not to be. And I think the speed is important as well. Uh, in a lot of Eastern European nations, it's still okay for investors to do three months due diligence, to be wiring half a year after signing the term sheet. This is really bad yeah. behavior. And when we talk, you know, we, so we take the US approach. Once we sign a term sheet, once we, we want to, you know, wire in less than a month and usually in two, two weeks. So that's something no one expects. And we want to be the VC that surprises the founders in a positive way to say, focus on the business, we are committed. We we won't be, you know, dragging that process. We still need to do the checks, the safe checks. We need to do the reputation checks. It is mostly about reputation checks yeah. in the earliest stages. So we need to do that. But we won't be dragging the process for no reason. We want you to focus on building the company. So to our listeners, if you're finding this interesting, you want to learn more, stay tuned because on EU.VC, we will launch the memo which is basically an article detailing this and much more about about smart ventures fund 2 and there you can also apply to join the syndicate and then once you are approved there you can get access to a bunch of super interesting information that really sheds a lot of light on everything we're talking about with some examples some numbers and some hard written stuff which is always nice but before we round this off i want to dedicate some time to what i'll call unfair advantage and boris you kind of took us there but let's 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 give it a little highlight here. And you know, again, yesterday we were talking about what are Smok's superpowers, and as you just said, now you know two things came up: speed, decision making, and then also this US slash CE hybrid approach, kind of whatever we want to call it, that you literally just just took us through. So I'll ask a slightly different question, which is, you know, when we think about CE and we think about early stages, a lot of other names come to mind, right? And Honestly, lo no, names we love, right? And just to name a few, and I'm not going to be extensive, you know, we have Credo, we have OTB, we have Trend, we have Innovo, we have Underline upcoming, super cool. Startup Wise Guys, which is actually uh, one of our investments as well. What else? I don't know. I could go on for hours. We have Launch Hub, uh, Kaya. And so they're all amazing, in my opinion, and, and many others are. And so my question isn't, why are you best? No, is what are you doing different? So how do you position differently to these players? And, and I'd love I'd love to hear the kind of you guys expand a bit on that and why you think that makes sense. And maybe just because we're also investing into 500 Emerging Europe and David didn't say that, but they are probably one of the funds that come the closest to you. I see them as coming from the other end of Europe. So that in itself is just a big difference. And I believe that CE will not be dominated by one player. It will have multiple, but they're also a software and game dev. <laughs> so in that sense, there are parallels or they're close to you. And what I always say, well, I know I know Boris and, and Ennis and, and you two are, are quite friendly with each other. So in that sense, it's more about being partners and head-to-head -head competitors. But obviously you will run into deals where you're also competing. But I would I would love you to, uh, to, to expand on that part specifically. 
especially because many of our investors will probably be saying, okay, should I do smart or should I do 500 or should I do both? Um, you know, <laughs> don't give advice, <laughs> but but I'd love to hear you uh, juxtapose that a bit as well as you see. A lot of those those folks that you mentioned are good friends, and those are our some of them are our preferred investment partners. Like in Romania, we probably wouldn't do a deal if we haven't consulted Bogdan firm uh, underline. And in you know, if we did something in Tur- we, we're not doing anything in Turkey, but if we did something in in Balkans, we probably would be chatting with 500. We're talking to them a lot when they now present in you know in in Poland and in, in Budapest. So uh, we're chatting about a lot of deals together. I think it's going to be more about the cooperation approach when we lead them to some of the good deals here and they lead the, us to some of the good deals in, in the regions they're more, more uh, focused on. Some of the other guys like OTB and Innovo are later stage, so usually they would be investing after us and they've done a few investments uh, into our companies. Same with Credo, although they changed the strategy a bit recently and they want to do some early stage deals as well. I don't think it's going to be one company, just like in Silicon Valley, there is Benchmark Grace, you know, you know there is... A number of really, really good companies, not just Andreessen, not just uh, Sequoia. Uh, I think it's going to be a few uh, in the local ecosystem. Us, uh, I think that it's so, so early stage in the in the CE that all of those funds are, are naturally specialized, and most of those funds are generic investors in early stage deals. Once that ecosystem grows, all of us are going to get into the sweet spot. And I can already see our sweet spot being closer to the engineering, closer to, uh, as with the game dev, but also with the developer tools. I've been an engineer. I was a you know, Java programmer and Python programmer for 10 years. So I really understand that part of business. And I think tools around AI, tools around no-code tools, that kind of stuff we're going to be more focused on compared to, say, fintech or compared to some other stuff we're not that well exposed to. So those funds are going to be both a bit more regional, but also a bit more specialized in specific industries. With us, it's going to be probably the engineering tools, game dev and AI. But if you say unfair advantage, I would say I would still feel it's Paul (laughs) Bragill. That's the biggest one, I think. I mean, this is a superstar. It's, you know, he's a superstar comparable to Tim Draper or some other guys. And he's really, he could be a, like an amazing asset for each of our companies if you use Paul and also he's better than well. So I would say this probably is something that gets us, some of the founders that want to work with us, they, they, they want to work because they just, you know, like to hang out with Diana or myself. But some of them would be would say, hey, I choose Smog because I feel this gets me the kind of, just like they do with Y Combinator, this kind of stamp that they get for life. They feel in certain uh, regions in Central Eastern Europe, Poland for sure, but I think Ukraine also, and also, you know, hopefully adding more and more countries, they will feel this is the kind of stamp that gets them the next funding easier, that gets them exposed to the great players in, in Asia and the US easier because they've done deals with Paul. They've done deals with Dan, and it's just way easier to make a deal if you feel someone you know, you trust, you've done deals before, is already in the cap table. They've done the DD. So I would say that's the current uh, unfair advantage and how the, the ecosystem evolves. You know, who knows, but we want to be one of the leading players and definitely work with those guys that you mentioned, uh, not just those guys, a number of others as well. Yeah. Far from being an extensive list. <laughs> so, Boris, you notice, Diana, this is new for you. We always end our episodes with a quick fire round. Quick fire round is when we ask quick answer questions, 30 to 60 seconds each. However, Boris, you don't have an advantage here because we have special questions for the memo episodes. Oh, no. <laughs> so you can't you can't just re-listen to your, your past pod and, and, and repeat. Anyway, first question, and this these are questions that we love, so we're really looking forward to hear your answers. And this one... Boris, I'll ask you to answer first. And the question is, why the hell does the world need Smog? Ten years ago, when I was looking for funding for my startup, I talked to a number of investors in Central Eastern Europe. Most of them were jerks, unfortunately. It, it was a horrible experience. And even at that time, I thought, hey, this needs to be fixed. I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And only now, <laughs> some really cool guys, cool players show up. So I think... One of the main motivations for me to be part of the VC ecosystem is to basically try to guide it into the right direction, into the founder-friendly direction, into the direction 
inspired a lot by, by Silicon Valley and how VC ecosystem was developed there. So I want to be smart, to, to, to be, you know, the default answer to be the, the most Silicon Valley type of fund operating in centuries in Europe in the, in the founders' minds to be smart. Second question of quick fire and Diane, and now I'll put you on the spot. And that question is, what do you think Smog will be like in 10 years? Where I see Smog is being one of the leaders in the C early stage investment. So if you think as the founder, okay, I want to have my first VC on board. And I think I want Smog to be the one to be chosen, to be the chosen one in terms of like, okay, so who we want to work with, who, who is giving us the, the bigger value and who, is, who has the right approach on how to work with us and has the right standards. Third and final question, and here I'll let whoever wants to take it to take it. And to round things up, why should LPs pick Smock? I don't want boring LPs. I don't want LPs that just do it for the financial side of it. I want LPs that are like our other LPs. They're entrepreneurs, they're friends, they're people who are who care about the community in Central Eastern Europe, and they want to be part of, of something big, of a big force that we're building. So it's okay if you don't invest. <laughs> it's okay because if you don't, that usually means your culture, your kind of way of thinking about venture is just different to ours, and that's fine. I want this to be a bunch of people who believe in the common vision of how venture capital should work in centuries in Europe, what kind of values we have, and we should be pushing that hard together. So, you know, if, if you feel that what you've listened to uh, makes sense. And if you don't feel we are complete freaks, and maybe if you do feel we're complete freaks and you still want to do it, that makes a lot of sense. I, I love that answer. Um, I think that it was very smart of you to flip it on its head and say, well, you know, <laughs> it's more about you than it's about us in a way. <laughs> um, but I love that. I love that answer. And I think that it speaks so well to also the kind of managers that we pick. So we have in our process a, uh, a collaboration uh, criteria, right? A partnership criteria that you need to tick as as a GP to uh, to, to become you know, part of our portfolio. And, and you take that in a big way. We've seen that on multiple occasions and that means a lot to us. Um, and that is why I think that our syndicate members in in this syndicate will also be experiencing that it's a, it's one of those syndicates that really gives a lot on the on the uh, soft side rather than, than, than just the financial side. So that was a really good answer. Diana, Boris, thanks so much for joining us for this episode. It is amazing to launch this journey with you so see you again uh every month or so for the next uh 10 years <laughs> yeah we're happy to be doing this and thank you thank you for having us thank you for listening to this episode of the european vc the go-to podcast for everything european vc if you love the show share with your friends and join our newsletter at eu.vc